Hi, I'm Kenny Yates, and this is Nuggets of Truth. Four of the most overlooked questions, I believe, that we as Christians take for granted are one, what is salvation? Two, why do I need salvation? And three, how do I get salvation? And number four, how do I know I have salvation? For us Christians, these answers are quite obvious, but for those who may not have had the luxury of being a part of a church or have never heard the term before and don't exactly know what it means, the answers are not so clear. So today, I want to continue answering these four very important questions with our second part in our four-part series entitled Salvation. Part one is entitled, What is Salvation? You can find it under a Nuggets of Truth category. This is part two entitled, Why Do I Need Salvation? Now with that said, please turn with me to John 3, 16 through 18 so that we can build our foundation. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only son of God. These verses imply with very little, if any doubt, two things. One, the need for salvation, and two, the path to salvation. Jesus made it clear that we need salvation, and without it, we will perish. Then he explained that God made a way for us to have or to receive the salvation, but we must first do something in order to obtain it. That something is believe and accept the free gift of Jesus. The bottom line is this. Without this free gift of salvation, we will not inherit eternal life, but rather we will perish forever. And that is the reason why we need salvation. I want us to look at Romans chapter 3, verse 23 through 25. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. That's Romans chapter 3, verse 23 through 25. Every single child born as a result of a man in a woman's corporation, that would be every single person on this earth. Everyone is born with inherent sin. Let me give a quick definition of inherent sin. Inherent sin is the sin that exists naturally and inseparably in everyone. That is innate sin that is passed down from father to children and cannot be washed away except by the shed blood of Jesus Christ through his granting of his salvation. Why is this? Because of Adam's sin in the Garden of Eden. And for further explanation on sin and Jesus' salvation, please check out our video, The Kinsman Redeemer, which can be found under our Nuggets of Truth category. Now, I want you to look at what, what, what Paul said in Romans chapter 6, verse 23. It says, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Because of this inerrant sin in our life, there is but one law, death to the sinner. This debt must be paid before we can enter eternity with God the Father and God the Son, which is Jesus Christ. In other words, in order for us to live in eternity, Jesus had to provide the way through his redemptive work on the cross of Calvary. That is called salvation. Because God sees us as unclean. We need Jesus' salvation then to make us clean. But someone may ask, are we though? Does God really see us as unclean sinners? Look at what God said through Isaiah. 
But we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousness are as filthy rags. Isaiah 64, verse 6. Even what seems like righteous acts that we do are still considered as unclean because God is so pure and so holy. As it is written, none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Romans chapter 3, verse 10 through 12. This means no one is inherently good. But whose standards is good measured by anyway? Well, how about culture? Culture is ever-changing. What is considered good today will be considered evil tomorrow. Just like how those things that were frowned upon in days gone by are now praised and are glorified today. Therefore, popular culture is out. It cannot be used. It changes too often. Well, what about government then? Neither does government qualify to determine what is right or what is wrong, since whatever political party that gets in will determine good and evil according to their manifesto and their understanding of good and evil. Moreover, if it affects them or someone they love, then their worldview on that matter will hugely change. It will be hugely compromised. So, good and evil can only be defined by an unchanging benchmark. And what's that benchmark? That benchmark is God. Only God can determine what is good or evil as defined in his holy word. But someone will argue, doesn't God change? Isn't he the same God that said an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth? Now, he's saying, turn the other cheek. Isn't that changing? No, 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 it's not. God said of himself, for I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore, you, O children of Jacob, are not consumed. That's found in Malachi chapter 3, verse 6. But they will continue to argue further. And they say, that proves nothing. And they will point to the same argument that they stated earlier and reiterate. He did change. And again, I would say, no, that is not changing. Let me quickly explain why that is not changing. You see, in days before the law, the people did as they saw fit. They did whatever seemed right in their own eyes. And that's what scripture tells us. Popular culture decided what was right and what was wrong, what, what, should be, what should happen and what should not happen. So if someone slapped you in the face, you had the right to cut off that hand that slapped you. Or if someone beat you up and knocked out your tooth and you would lay wait them and kill them, and I take revenge that way. Again, you would be in your right to do so. So God gradually led mankind to the path of righteousness by putting a stop to that way of thinking. He said, if someone knocks out your tooth, you can knock out their tooth in return, but you cannot chop off their heads. Likewise, if someone slapped you in the face, you do not have the right to chop off that hand that slapped you, and so on and so forth. So please understand that to go straight from all revenge is legal to you can go this far and no further is more palatable than Jesus' radical teaching on grace and mercy. He even took it one step further when he preached a gospel of love that says, love your enemy and turn the other cheek. Give to whomever ask of you, even if it's your enemy. That way of thinking was too much too quickly. 
Here's another ex- example of this found in Matthew chapter 19, verse 3 through 9. And the Pharisees came up to him and tested him by asking, Is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any reason? He answered, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female, and said, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh? So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. They said to him, Why then did Moses command one to give a certificate of divorce and send her away? He said to them, Because of your hardness of your heart, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. This would have to have been too much too soon. So Moses gave them a certificate of divorce just to keep the peace between God and man, so to speak, until the fullness of time when Jesus came and gave to us a better way, a much better way. Therefore, God did not change. He wanted to lead and guide mankind, not to drive and compel mankind, which would inevitably cause a definite and certain rebellion. Now, back to my explanation of the need for salvation. Remember that death is a consequence of sin. Therefore, death is the price that must be paid. So when God laid all of the world's sin on Jesus and he died on the cross, he technically paid the price, which is the death penalty for all, for every single soul, at least for everyone who accepts it. Subsequently, we are no longer required to pay the death penalty for ourselves since the wages have been satisfied by Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Therefore, God has not changed his mind on sin. It is still, it still requires death, but we are no longer required to pay that death penalty ourselves. Thanks to Jesus, thanks to his love and his mercy. Let me further explain something. The law was fulfilled by Jesus on the cross when he said, it is finished. We understand that those under the law were slaves to sin since the law was not given to redeem them from sin, but rather to expose sin, according to Romans chapter 3, verse 19 through 20. Although the law was perfect, Humanity didn't and couldn't overcome sin through the law. So Jesus came to fulfill the law and thus succeeded where the blood of goats and lambs failed. With that established, God is an unchanging God. Therefore, he's the only one qualified to say what is moral and what is not moral. We are all born with what is known as a sin nature. This means we are born estranged from God according to the inherent sin definition we gave earlier. See Romans chapter 5 verse 12, verse 18 through 21, 1 Corinthians 15 verse 45, Ephesians chapter 2 verse 3, and Psalms 58 verse 3. Without salvation or the forgiveness of our sins, we will spend eternity in a place of torment created for the devil and his angels, according to Matthew chapter 25 verse 41. This is Jesus himself speaking. Then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Matthew chapter 25, verse 41. So let me sum all of this up for you. We need salvation because all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, according to Romans chapter 3, verse 23, which means we cannot make it into heaven merely on good deeds or by living a good life. We must enter by the blood, the shed blood of Jesus Christ and his salvation. Without salvation, we will spend eternity in a burning lake of fire. So, how do I receive the salvation? That's a really, really good question. 
I want you to join me next time for part three. How do I receive salvation? And I will do my endeavor best to answer that question. Well, I hope you enjoyed this video and that it helped you understand this really churchy term, salvation, as well as to help you see your need for it. If you liked this video, please hit the like button and would you share this video and hit the subscribe button for more videos like these. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Kenny Yates. This is Hold the Hope. Be blessed and stay blessed.